Hi guys, and welcome to the Feedonomics Facebook webinar. We're excited to talk about how to drive demand and sales on Facebook for your entire catalog today. I'm your host, Brian Roizen. I'm the co-founder and chief architect of Feedonomics, and we are a full service feed platform that helps our clients optimize their product data for hundreds of different channels, of course, including Facebook. Um, and we have a team of over 100 who help people optimize feeds. Uh, also joining me today is Emily Wilson, who's on the marketing partnerships team at Facebook. Her focus is in building partnerships that help advertisers adopt and scale ad products that, that Facebook has designed for the e-commerce vertical, including, of course, dynamic ads and catalog. As a product growth manager, Emily works closely with Facebook's product teams to identify opportunities for new partner ecosystems and partner product development. So I'm really excited to introduce Emily and I'm gonna let her take it away from here. Thanks so much, Brian. I'm super excited to be here as well um, to walk you guys through, uh, like Brian said, how you can drive demand and sales uh, for your entire product catalog with dynamic ads. So um, we'll jump right in. So just to run through um, the agenda, we'll sort of cover the foundational components first of why inventory is important and how you can actually get your inventory into Facebook. We'll talk about what else you need to do in order to get set up to run ads. And then finally, we'll walk through our dynamic ad solution and how you can use it to promote your inventory across the entire Facebook family of apps. Um, and we'll save time at the end to run through some best practices um, and do some Q&A. So um, let's start with the basics. Why is inventory important on Facebook? Catalog, uh, which is our inventory platform, is a foundational component of both paid and organic experiences on Facebook. The team's mission um, is really to power meaningful connections between the world's inventory, businesses, and people through a number of different products and experiences. So if we think about our three sort of main use cases of catalog and of inventory on Facebook today, um, dynamic ads and collection, which are sort of shoppable ad formats, are um, a major use case, uh, which we'll talk about in more detail later on. Um, and then we also power, or Catalog also powers um, some organic experiences as well, like uh, our marketplace, which is uh, essentially uh, a marketplace where you can buy and sell products in your local area and beyond, as well as Instagram shopping, which is a fairly new, again, organic product that allows you to tag um, products from your catalog in images in which they appear on on Instagram so that people have this really um, obvious connection between what they're seeing in the photo and, and the ability to purchase it. Um, but even with these three use cases, I mean, we expect that uh, sort of the number of inventory based products and um, experiences that we offer on, on the Facebook family is going to continue to grow um, into 2019 and beyond. Everything is sort of moving in the direction of being inventory based because it allows us to even further personalize the um, experience for the individual user by showing them products and services that we know they're going to be interested in. Um, so without getting your inventory into Facebook, you won't be able to take advantage of these really sophisticated high performing ad units or some of these organic experiences um, and shopping surfaces where people may be able to buy the products that you're selling. So what is a catalog? Um, Hopefully this is not new uh, to any of the folks that are that are listening to this webinar, but um, we use this term to describe uh, a structured file that contains all the data about the products you may want to advertise or list on one of our shopping surfaces. Each line in your catalog contains all of the information that you would need um, to run a dynamic ad, for example. So um, we'll be using that term a lot throughout the webinar, but again, this is just our high level catalog is our high level term as well as our, our platform within Facebook um, that contains all of that product data. Okay, so now uh, you understand what a catalog is and, and how we think about uh, catalogs and inventory within Facebook. Um, so how do you actually create one? There's a couple of different ways uh, to get your inventory into Facebook. Um, so the first one being manually, you can actually add products one by one in our catalog manager user interface. 
we don't we're not going to focus on that one today because it's really recommended only for customers who have less than 50 products um, and again it being manual means it's very hard to scale um, the ones that we tend to see the most adoption uh, of our feeds and the api and I'll talk through those in a bit more detail so you can use a data feed um, to get your products into facebook we support a number of formats um, and we also allow you to set a schedule to automatically update your inventory from a feed URL. So again, we recommend this for advertisers with more than 50 products. Um, and this is a super popular way of, of getting a feed into the platform. Um, we also are compatible with um, Google, which is probably the, the biggest use case of, of feeds that most of our advertisers are pretty familiar with. We're compatible with that. So you can take a feed um, that you're using for Google and, and actually put it into Facebook pretty easily. Uh, the second option would be to use our API. Um, this allows you to create your catalog product and product feeds, schedule fetches, and update your inventory um, via a batch API. It's designed for large catalogs, so we recommend it for advertisers who have a lot of products to sell and whose inventory changes fairly quickly. Um, so you can actually create, update, and delete many items within a single request. Um, so if you're a large advertiser or a developer, uh, the API is, is a great way to go. That being said, uh, even with this sort of variety of ways to get your inventory into Facebook and, and what we feel like are um, sort of uh, solid solutions, it's still a pretty um, significant challenge for advertisers to get their inventory into Facebook um, for a number of reasons. The data might not be formatted correctly. It might live in a bunch of different places that the um, advertiser doesn't have access to. There's a ton of reasons why um, it's a challenge. So one of the things that we um, on the partnerships team have started to do in 2018 and will continue into 2019 is um, to sort of expand our catalog ecosystem um, or our ecosystem of partners that can help advertisers do this. Um, and Feedonomics is a, is a really awesome example of, of one such partner that we've partnered partnered very closely with over the last year and a half or so. And again, we'll continue to uh, work closely with into 2019 and beyond. So we found that working with these catalog or feed partners like Feedonomics makes a big difference. They can help advertisers format the data correctly, um, aggregate it from a bunch of different sources, put it into the necessary uh, format for Facebook, get it onto Facebook a lot faster. They can optimize product data uh, to ensure that it's high quality and has um, sort of the best possible detail because we know that higher quality product data results in more conversions. And they can also help advertisers unlock new products and verticals. Um, so we're focusing on dynamic ads for e-commerce today, but we have a number of other um, solutions, uh, verticalized dynamic ad solutions that partners can help advertisers get uh, their data, product data prepared for. And they can also give uh, potentially give access to new products like Marketplace or Instagram shopping. So um, with that said, I just want to hand it off to Brian to talk a little bit about the Feedonomics solution and what Feedonomics can do um, for their customers around providing feeds to Facebook. Thanks, Emily. So Feedonomics helps in a couple of different ways for Facebook specifically. Um, with the very first step of what we help with is we make it very easy to get your product feed out of your current e-commerce platform. So we support a few dozen different e-commerce integrations that we have with our APIs and scripts that we've created to easily get data out, including, of course, Shopify, BigCommerce, uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, and even custom platforms. So in the case that, uh, and this, this is a pretty interesting one, but you might have a very custom e-commerce platform that you can't create any kind of feed out of. Uh, so we can actually dynamically crawl your website and we do this um, on some kind of recurring basis. So as you change information on your website, we can actually dynamically create a product feed out of it. Um, for other verticals, we do the same thing, including for flights, hotels, and, and travel as well. The second component is of what we do is optimization. So we, after we get your product data into Feedonomics, we can optimize any attribute that we have access to. And we like to say at a high level, um, any kind of data transformation you can describe in English, we can actually do. 
And of course, the last step is creating recurring feeds that we can send to Facebook. And we do this all for our clients on a full service basis. We do have self-service clients as well, but we actually do the heavy lifting of bringing the data in, optimizing it and exporting it, as well as troubleshooting when issues arise. Um, one of the interesting things that we've added for Facebook specifically is the ability to add image padding. Um, this is a pretty interesting problem that almost anyone who has uh, products in the fashion or apparel space has dealt with, where you've got these uh, rectangular images that are not square. They might be um, portrait or they might be landscape, but of course they're not square images. And Facebook specs require square images in a certain resolution such that they don't appear uh, like the image here in the bottom center. So what we can do is we can actually take the current background of the image and extend it to make portrait or landscape images square, uh, not just for Facebook, but also for Instagram as well. So you can make these images look significantly nicer, which of course improves, improves click-through rates and if, at the end of the day, uh, return on ad spend. Uh, next. One of the other uh, interesting things about Feedonomics is we can really look at your feed on a very, very granular level. It might sound crazy that you know, a feed platform has the ability to actually see your data in a very visual format, but we do. We have the ability to see both raw as well as optimized data side by side. And once we are able to do that, we can see what kinds of optimization should we make to attributes like title, attributes like images, attributes like uh, categorization. Um, so with FeedGrader, what we've done is we've created a tool that can create very powerful audits. Um, and I encourage everyone listening in to take, us, take advantage of our offer for a free audit. Um, but what it looks at is it looks at a lot of common issues that we see in feeds day in, day out. Problems with rogue HTML, problems with titles not containing descriptive words like brand, color, and size. And these are really important ones on Facebook because it's remarketing. So when a user views a particular product on your website and they even add it to cart, you want to basically retarget them and you want to show them that exact product that they looked at. In some cases, you might want to show a similar or like product, but in many cases, the most direct application is showing the exact product. And if you're not able to describe that product, if you're missing you know, the brand, if you have the word Air Jordan, instead of Nike Air Jordan running shoes or basketball shoes or something that's more appropriate and more relevant to what the user actually looked at, you're not going to have as high of a chance of converting them because they might just skip over it in their Facebook feed. Um, so these are some pretty important challenges that FeedGrader can identify and that we can solve through data optimization. We can also look at issues like duplicate titles, IDs, Things that uh, might be very hard to see unless you look at every individual uh, product title category, category that you have set. And these are some great opportunities that we can identify with FeedGrader. Uh, next. Um, the other one, and this, this is at the heart of what we do, and that's feed optimization. So there are a lot of interesting things that you can do if you uh, really utilize some of the different attributes available. And by that, I mean utilizing custom labels. So because Facebook's feed format is very similar to the Google Shopping feed format, a lot of people just take their Google Shopping feed and send it straight to Facebook and they assume it will perform well. In some cases it might, but there are some very specific Facebook optimizations that you should be doing. Um, the same way that you don't have a set it and forget it approach for campaigns and bids, the feed is something that we believe should be looked at constantly and, and improved upon. So some of the things that we're able to do is we're able to do title A-B testing as well as image A-B testing. In many cases, um, it's, it's an interesting question, right? Is it better to have the title that is Nike Air Jordan shoes or is it better to say Air Jordan shoes by Nike? And so it's one of those classic things that you don't necessarily know, you might have a hunch, but you can actually test it and see what is the better option through A-B testing, which we can do in Feedonomics. Um, we also have the ability to do image A-B testing. So you might have alternative image links as a field, and you might have an image that you're not sure what is you know, the most attractive, the nicest image to show to a user inside of their Facebook newsfeed. And you might wanna A-B test that. So that's something that we can help you set up as well. 
Um, the other one that we see is constantly underutilized in uh, people who are using Facebook uh, dynamic ads currently are custom labels. So normally the way that you can do your bid segmentation is, is on category and brands. And in many cases that works, but there's a lot of very specific ways to use custom labels that allow you to get very granular in your bid segmentation. Some of the things that we see constantly are price. So you might be selling two pairs of Nike shoes. One might cost $60 and you might have another one, which is an autograph Michael Jordan Nike shoe, and that might be $10,000. And clearly um, I'm giving extremes here, but clearly there's a lot more that you can spend on that $10,000 pair of shoes to reach that point of profitability. So as such, you can afford to bid more on it. And how do you bid more on it if you know these two pairs of shoes are the exact same category, exact same brand? So there are a few different things you can do, but custom labels is one of the cleanest solutions. You can easily create bidding groups. So you can say if the price is less than $100, put this into the medium price bucket. But if it's over $100 or let's say if it's over $1,000, put this into the more expensive custom label bucket. And with that, you can create different bidding groups. And so price is just one example of custom labels that we've seen perform really well on Facebook. Some of the other ones that we're able to do are based on performance. Because we're able to merge data from anywhere into our feed, we can also create performance-based custom labels. So you can say, if my return on ad spend or my ROAS is greater than five, put this into the high performing bucket. If it's less than three, uh, we can either exclude the products entirely because it might not make sense to advertise and, and remarket products that have a very low return on ad spend. So there's some very interesting things you can do there too, where you can just exclude those low performing products inside of Feedonomics. Um, some of the other custom labels that we, we commonly recommend for Facebook are promotion and sale based. So if an item is on sale and it's, you know, 50% off, which is a very common one uh, that happened over Black Five Day last year, um, that'd be a great custom label to use. And then, of course, if you have margin data available, we can actually bring that into your feed on a per SKU basis. So you know exactly what that point of profitability is for every individual product you sell. And you can create custom labels that act accordingly. So you can bid more when a product has a higher profitability or margin and lower when it has less. Uh, next slide. The last uh, interesting thing that we've added uh, very recently actually is product data governance. And that's really a fancy way of saying, how do you address ongoing issues that might occur in your feed? So the, the classic example is what happens when new products are added in your feed? So if you have categorization already set up where you know, you're categorizing shoes into the shoe category on either Google or Facebook or any channel, what happens when a new product category surfaces? All of a sudden you have no category for it. You're probably not doing title optimization correctly because it's a new category. So in many cases, those products are just running and eating up ad spend because they're not optimized. In Feedonomics, what we've done with data governance is we've created queries or rules that you can use to immediately alert you in any scenario possible. So some examples of that include when new products are added but are not optimized. So you can get notified, for example, when a product is not categorized or it's missing a critical attribute. Like let's say that you always expect that your prices will have a dollar sign. And if what we can do here is we can create a data governance query to say if my price does not have a dollar sign, immediately send me an alert and stop the export. So this solves a lot of data integrity challenges that really, really um, plague any export that you might be sending out because unless you're checking every single one, which in many cases might be every hour, it's a little bit too much. And unless you're logging into Facebook all the time to actually see the errors, you can easily miss it and result in a lot of wasted ad spend or your feed just being inconsistent or, or not uh, being fully optimized. So this is a really interesting way that we've, we've built in um, data governance and more specifically to solve a lot of these, these constant challenges that happen from time to time. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, back to Emily, who's gonna talk about uh, actually running the ads. Awesome, thanks so much, Brian. And um, just to echo everything Brian said, I think, um, like I mentioned, we see partners as a, as a in 
hugely valuable resource um, for our customers to get set up to run dynamic ads and to sort of take advantage of our most sophisticated dynamic ads offerings. Um, so really excited to see all the progress that Feedonomics has made and, and how much they're helping our advertisers um, get the most out of, out of their ads on Facebook. So once you have your catalog set up, um, there's one additional step that you need to complete before you can run ads, um, and that is the pixel. Um, essentially, um, we need to be able to collect signals from your website or app, um, and the Facebook pixel is placed on your, on your website or app, and it sends signals from uh, your website or app back to Facebook so we can understand uh, what kind of behavior your, your customers are, are engaging with. So to dig in a little bit more, um, the pixel allows you to track the actions that you actually care about um, to optimize your ads and retarget your customers. Um, when it comes to leveraging intent, installing the face Facebook pixel is uh, incredibly helpful um, because essentially the path to purchase is no longer linear. Today's customers uh, can browse, discover, and purchase through a variety of apps and websites across multiple devices. Um, and this cross-device activity creates intent signals um, that, if captured, have the potential to give you really valuable insights and better inform your marketing strategy. Um, we know that delivering relevant content is vital to success in advertising, and the Facebook Pixel is really designed to provide that insight. Um, it enables advertisers to leverage the, the website or app signals, build relevant audiences based on actions taken on your site, optimize your campaigns to deliver higher value results, and measure the overall success across the Facebook family of apps and services. Um, so the Pixel unlocks some of our most sophisticated products like dynamic ads, um, and it's hugely important to make sure that your Pixel is implemented um, and implemented correctly. So let's just talk quickly about um, a few of those best practices. You wanna set up events um, for the full conversion funnel on your website or app. Um, and that means installing the pixel on every page of your website so that you have insight into the customer's path to purchase. Um, we provide a number of standard events and you can also create your own custom events um, if you need them. Um, so standard events include things like search, view category, view content, add to cart and purchase. Um, and like I said, you can also create custom events if, if your website um, pages don't sort of fit those standards. And it's important again to do that so that you have the full path to purchase and you're, you can get signal for what a user is doing at sort of every stage um, in the funnel. Second is uh, making sure that you add the correct product IDs to your events. Um, this is how we match the product browsing activity on your website or app to the products within your catalog. Um, and you can see in this uh, example here, uh, when a content ID fires in the pixel, for example, A1234, um, we actually go back to the catalog that you provided. We match that ID to the from the pixel to the ID in the catalog, and that's how we know um, what product to serve the user in the ad. And finally, you want to make sure that your um, setup is accurate as possible in the product events tab um, in Ads Manager. And, and essentially, the rule of thumb is to try to ensure that you're matching 100% of your product IDs or as close to 100% of your product IDs to your catalog as possible. If, you're, if your match rate is low, that means that either um, your product IDs in your uh, signal and your pixel are not matching what's in the catalog, um, which means that we have less information to make decisions about what ads to show an individual user. So as close as you can get to 100 is best. So now you have your catalog ready. You have your pixel sending signals from your website or app. Now it's time to actually promote your products. And um, the uh, ad unit that we want to talk about today, um, which is our most sophisticated um, and also most performative uh, ad, is dynamic ads. With dynamic ads, you can capture um, intent signals from the pixel to automatically promote relevant products from your entire catalog across Facebook, Instagram, and audience network. You can reach people across devices and across Facebook, Instagram, and audience network with one or more products in a single ad. 
Um, so you're actually connecting with people where they spend their time. And we see dynamic ads as having um, sort of, there's four main reasons why this uh, ad unit is, is so powerful and performs so well. Um, so number one being scale, you can promote all of your inventory with unique creative without having to configure each individual ad. So if you weren't using dynamic ads and you wanted to um, ensure that your potential customers were seeing products that they might be interested in, you'd have to spend a lot of time creating hundreds or even thousands of ad variants, as well as audiences and matching those together. Uh, whereas with dynamic ads, that's all taken care of automatically. We use the signal from the pixel and the information from the catalog to show each individual user um, a product that they're gonna be interested in. Second, um, it's always on. You set up your campaigns once, and because it's relying on this signal from the pixel, um, those ads are continually reaching people with the right products at the right time. It's cross device, um, so you can reach people uh, with ads on any device that they use, um, like a tablet or a laptop or a cell phone, regardless of their original touch point of where they originally visited your website or app. Um, so if they looked at a product um, on your mobile app and then they later went to desktop, uh, we could sort of follow them with that same ad um, wherever it is that they're going. And finally, we, we sort of touched on this with the first point, but dynamic ads are dynamically relevant. Um, you're showing a hyper relevant ad to a consumer based on uh, the signal from the pixel. So it's a product that we know they'll be interested in. Um, and we're also able to show real time pricing and availability based on your feed. So um, if you are having a sale, you can include that in your ad. Uh, we can pull that directly from the feed um, so that, you know, around the holidays or Black Friday, um, you can make sure that all of your ads have your sale prices in them, um, that kind of thing. So um, it's, it's much easier, like I said, than trying to create all these ad variants individually and trying to make sure that they're all kept up to date with whatever information from your product feed um, is relevant. So when using dynamic ads, you have two sort of distinct options. Um, so the first and sort of um, the way that this product was developed was around a retargeting, which essentially standard retargeting, you can target people who have already been to your site or app with products they have shown interest in. Um, and then uh, within the last year or so, we expanded to um, allow you to target more broadly uh, to generate demand and sales. So I'll dive into those two options a little bit deeper. So first, um, retargeting. Uh, when people visit your website and, or app and they take an action, like browsing a product or category or putting an item in their cart, they're expressing an explicit interest in your products. And you can actually leverage this intent um, to serve people ads with products that they're interested in, uh, from your inventory across the Facebook family of apps, regardless, again, of their original touch point. So we can see if they viewed these products on, on your website or app, then we can actually show them those products in ads. Um, you can also cross sell and upsell to people uh, that are likely to purchase through dynamic ads. So for example, if someone looked at a particular product on your website, um, and you know that this product doesn't typically convert well, you could show related products from your catalog that do convert well. Or if you see, for example, that someone bought a pair of shoes, you could uh, cross sell them, uh, or sorry, upsell them um, a pair of socks or uh, an, a lot, uh, insole or, or whatever it may be. And um, the other targeting option that I mentioned is to use what we call broad audiences. And with this option, you can extend your reach beyond recent purchasers and website visitors to people who have, have maybe actually not ever visited your website at all, or who at least have not been there um, for some time. And you can reach them with rel oops, sorry, you can reach them with relevant products that they're likely interested in based on um, the interest they've shown on your site, app, or other places on the web. Um, and, and the way that we do this is, is basically by um, 
looking at signal from from a bunch of different places that gives us a sign that a particular user is interested in a particular product or set of products and that includes things like um, their behavior on and off Facebook the pages that they like um, what uh, ads they interact with um, as well as their behavior uh, outside of Facebook and this is a great option for businesses who are looking to prospect for new customers um, or for smaller businesses who may not have uh, a ton of website traffic. Obviously, if you're using retargeting, um, your scale is limited to uh, the set of customers who have visited your website or app. Um, whereas with a prospecting product like this one, um, the scale potential is, is a lot larger. Um, and we see this work really well for small businesses um, and large businesses alike who are looking to find new customers. Um, and I also want to highlight some of the newest creative options that we've built into dynamic ads. Um, so uh, there's a, a lot more that um, you can do with dynamic ads and we'll have time to talk through in this webinar, but wanted to highlight a few of the, the latest things that we see working really well for our customers. Uh, so categories for dynamic ads is one example. Um, and what this feature essentially does is level up product recommendations to the brand or category level to drive results with shoppers who may not have shown um, explicit product level interest. So we know that um, there's a lot of signal that we see from customers who maybe visit um, like a, a home page on, on a, a retailer's website and they're looking at products for the home, but they never actually go down to the product details page or look at a specific set of products. Um, and we can leverage that uh, category level interest in this particular ad unit. So with, with categories for dynamic ads, you can paint um, a more holistic picture and showcase the types of products that you sell based on the shopper's general interest in a category. And the four categories that a um, shopper would see in an ad unit like this um, are those that most closely align to the their interest and the intent they've shown in products or categories of products that that we understand from our signal um, Fixed cards are another great option um, This essentially allows you to put a um, static card in your carousel to set context um, or to generate interest in a particular offering um, we see this work really well for uh, promotions. If you're having a sale um, or you're having an event, uh, putting a fixed card at the beginning of your dynamic ads carousel that shows the user, um, that sort of sets the context for the user or gives them uh, information about what they're going to be seeing is really useful. Um, we also see this work really well for smaller businesses that are using our broad audience tool to prospect where the customer um, might not potentially be familiar with the small business and what they offer. So they can use that static card to sort of, again, set the context and explain um, why that user should be interested in clicking through the rest of the carousel. And when you use um, fixed cards, we recommend that you create a product set that's relevant to this leading static card. Um, and good examples, again, are things like deals of the day, uh, category pages, um, trending products, that kind of thing. Um, the other uh, really cool thing that we've launched within the last several months is uh, what we call overlays for dynamic ads. Um, and what this does is allow you uh, to create, um, to automatically add price and discount tags on creative assets for product ads. Um, advertisers around the world now can build customizable creative templates for their dynamic ads to showcase products in compelling ways. Um, so if you were creating a Black Friday campaign with your catalog, you could add an overlay to that. Um, and we've seen really great success with this. Um, and the other thing I would add here is that um, we have built a version of this ourselves, but many of our partners have really sophisticated creative overlay tools. Um, Brian walked through some of Feedonomics capabilities earlier in the deck. Um, so while this is an offering within Facebook, we see um, our partners adding a ton of value here for our customers by doing um, really custom branded type overlays that um, are sort of unique to the individual advertiser as opposed to using um, some of the sort of more canned ones that are available within Facebook. 
So um, let's talk through a few of the best practices that will help you make the most out of your dynamic ads campaign. So hopefully now you have a good sense of what dynamic ads is um, and, and why we think it's so great. Again, it uh, provides scale, ads are dynamically relevant, it's always on, um, and we see it perform super well for our, our customers. Um, so I wanna talk through a few of um, what we see as sort of the most important things to keep in mind as you're running one of these campaigns. So um, we want to ensure that your potential customers are seeing super high quality relevant product data. We talked about this um, and we see partners as, as being a great way to sort of follow these best practices. Uh, you wanna keep your catalog up to date with scheduled uploads and that ensures that you have the most up-to-date information for your campaigns. You can update as frequently as you want um, and working with a partner makes that pretty easy. Um, again, we talked about this, but having high quality and accurate information about your products is crucial. Um, it's really important to keep that information up to date because it, it has a direct impact on the performance of your ads. If, you know, we see some customers, if they don't update their product catalog and they're showing, um, products in their ads and then the user clicks through and sees that that product is um, not in stock anymore or doesn't come in the color that they're interested in and that's a really poor experience for the customer um, and it also doesn't result in a conversion um, and ROAS for the advertiser. And finally, again, drive this point home, we recommend working with our partners like Feedonomics uh, because they can not only sort of handle these first two things that we talked about, but um, can also offer some more advanced features like hourly schedules um, and line item updates. Um, we see again that this uh, is a hugely valuable thing for our customers who, who are really want to take advantage of the dynamic ad solution. Um, choosing the right product sets is also really important. Um, and product sets are basically ways to um, organize your product catalog and enable you to control bids and product recommendations. So choosing the right balance of clearly defined product sets can help you maximize your reach and control spend. Um, we recommend starting with broadly defined product sets with large numbers of items, and then slowly introducing more nuanced product sets rules, product set rules as you see the performance come through. Um, so some examples of, of product sets that we've seen be super effective um, would be one set for each product category, like shoes, dresses, um, makeup, whatever it may be. Um, sets, product sets per price range. So if a product is particularly expensive, um, we, you may want to bid higher for that uh, product set when you put it promoted in ads because there's a higher ROAS for you. Uh, product sets by markdowns or promotional pricing. Again, you can change the language in your ads. If you're promoting a product set that is just including your sale items, you can make sure that your um, the content of your, the text of your ad, excuse me, contains um, lots of language that sort of highlights the fact that you're, these things are on sale. Um, or you could organize by themes like basketball or um, home goods or, or whatever it may be. Uh, the possibilities are are pretty, um, I don't want to say endless, but there, there's a lot of possibilities for how to create product sets. Um, and so we see the most successful advertisers are definitely taking advantage of this. Um, again, you want to start large, but then once you start to see what's actually performing, creating broad but logical product sets um, works really well. Um, you can also add custom columns in your catalog to include additional information about your products. So um, like we said, our uh, standard feed format uh, is designed to be compatible with Google. It contains sort of all of the basic um, product information that, that you would expect, um, but we allow you to create custom catalogs to allow more um, customization like margin or value score uh, for you as an individual, um, stock levels, 
product shipping weight or best sellers. And you can use these custom columns to create more advanced product sets. And similarly, um, sort of our most sophisticated advertisers use these quite heavily uh, because they always have sort of um, a custom uh, implementation that they want to use or a set of data that they want to um, build their catalogs around that isn't part of the standard set that we offer. Um, in terms of creative, um, here are some tips to think about uh, creative considerations that can help improve the performance of your dynamic ads. Um, we see that high quality imagery, unsurprisingly, works the best. Um, you want to include price in your ad creative to help boost C click through rates or CTRs. Um, well, we, we see that uh, Users really love to um, not be surprised when they click through to the landing page. Um, so being as sort of clear and upfront as possible about what it is, what the price of the product is that they're looking at works well. You want a deep link to products in your app to maximize conversions. Um, so if you're driving people to your mobile app, um, if you, we see that conversion rates are higher when they add deep link into an app instead of a mobile website. And uh, you also want to avoid making too many creative changes because this can impact your delivery. This is particularly important if you have time sensitive campaigns or high traffic periods um, so that you don't lose impressions during these times. Um, but overall, uh, creative, because you're using uh, the, the content from the feed, um, you don't have to think about creative sort of as much as you might for another type of ad because we're helping you configure the ad automatically. And just to dive into that a little bit more, um, configuring your ad template um, is how we refer to actually building what the ad will look like. And these are templates uh, because again, we are populating the information in the ad directly from the product feed uh, when we show the user the ad and the product that we're pulling in um, to the ad is dependent on the individual user. So you're not actually building out all these ad units, you're creating a single template and then we are filling in the information at the time of ad serve. Uh, so um, well, optional, we definitely recommend adding a call to action button like a shop now. Uh, we recommend using a carousel because that allows you to display more than one product and it's a really engaging ad format. Um, I think we, we chatted about this, but adding a card with this fixed image um, to set context or if you're promoting a very narrow category of products. And cards will populate automatically from your catalog. Uh, we recommend high quality images again. And when the campaign actually goes live, like I said, the product cards will be personalized to your target audience based on the products that they've viewed on your site. Um, so that is the template. So targeting, so we've talked about um, creative, we've talked about product sets. Now, how, how do I actually target my ads in order to drive the best possible performance? Um, we recommend starting simple. A great place to start is just an audience of people who have viewed or added to cart, but not purchased recently, for example, in the last 10 days. Um, we rec recommend that you don't use additional targeting overlays like um, interests, or age, uh, two restrictive age groups, or um, things like that, because if people are already shopping on your website, um, you can. It's safe to assume that they're interested in the in the products that you offer. Um, unless you run a subscription service, uh, we recommend not forgetting to include people, exclude people, excuse me, who make a purchase um, from all your campaigns in order to focus your campaign activities on acquiring new customers. Um, you can re-engage purchasers later if they haven't been back to your website in a while with another campaign, but generally we recommend excluding people who have purchased recently, um, again, in order to grow that customer base. And depending on your website traffic, um, you might want to think about some additional tips to maximize your reach, like um, increasing your audience by changing your audience retention window. Um, so if you extend your audience retention window, which essentially uh, is the number of days that um, you want to keep people in the audience since they've viewed a product on your site or app, um, if you ex increase that number uh, like to 90 days, you're going to be able to reach even more people. 
The other options are things like targeting all devices um, and using cross-device reporting to help you understand the value of cross-device conversions and optimize along the conversion path. Um, we talked about this at the very beginning, but just again to drive it home, using all of the possible um, placements like uh, so Facebook feed, um, uh, Instagram, audience network, um, you'll get more delivery for your ads if you decide to opt into all these places. And we on, the, on our side can sort of optimize um, to make sure that we are not only showing the right user or the right product, but in the right surface um, to actually drive those conversions. Um, other targeting uh, ideas are around segmentation. Um, we recommend creating ad sets by action type and time period to give yourself the opportunity to vary bids by segment, decide when each audience will see your ads, and see metrics by audience. Um, so, for example, it's safe to assume that people who add an item to their cart have more intent than people just who are browsing. Um, so if you consider, you might consider creating separate target targeting buckets and bidding higher for people who have both viewed to content, viewed uh, a piece of content and added to cart than you might for, for folks who have just viewed a particular product. Um, you could set a higher bid for people who have added to cart but not purchased. Um, you could also set time periods to your targeting. You might want to bid higher, for example, on people who viewed your products within the last week versus in the last 20 days. Um, and other options would be to think about segmenting by device type um, or product categories. Um, so there's a ton of options there. General rule of thumb, um, like with everything, is to avoid segmenting too finely, which could impact your delivery. And finally, um, here are a few basic recommendations for optimizing your campaigns. Um, you always want to optimize for sales rather than clicks. Um, Facebook offers a ton of different optimization options, um, but in order to ensure that your campaigns are shown to people who are likely to make a purchase, you wanna optimize for people who are actually buying things. Um, you wanna set your true bid value. So rather than trying to sort of undercut the auction uh, by bidding lower, set, make sure you're bidding for, for what the value, the value that um, you actually care about. And that again ensures that you are showing ads, or sorry, we at Facebook are showing ads to customers who are not only gonna be interested in your products, but who actually are gonna um, buy the products that you're selling. And finally, we've mentioned this a few times, but um, keep your campaigns always on. Your potential buyers are shopping all the time. Um, and with dynamic ads, because it's automated, you don't really have to think about it. So we always recommend that people keep their dynamic ads campaigns on at all times, um, as well as planning for high traffic days around markdowns and promotions. So um, that is everything that I had to cover. I think, um, Brian, we can move on to Q&A. Awesome, sounds great. Uh, so if you guys haven't already sent over your questions, um, please do so in the in the question box in a GoToWebinar. Uh, so I'll answer a couple of these, which are, are is the recording gonna be sent out? Um, yes, it will definitely be sent out as long as you registered. We'll be sending it out most likely tomorrow. Um, next question, uh, what should we do if we want a free feed audit? Uh, if you want a free feed audit, feel free to contact us at hello at Feedonomics or just go to our website and, and request a demo. Happy to help you out there. Um, here's, here's another interesting question. Uh, we have multiple part numbers for the same part. Does Facebook allow replication of lines within a feed for multiple part numbers to be able to drive to the same link? Um, so I'll take a stab and I'd love to hear your perspective, Emily. Sure. Uh, so in Feedonomics, we actually have the ability to send child level or parent only level rows. Um, I've actually seen it happen both ways. Um, so long as your tracking pixel is set up correctly. So if you wanna send just your child products or if you only wanna send a parent level product and default to you know the first child image, that's something we can do inside of Feedonomics so long as your tracking pixel is set up correctly. Uh, what yeah. do you think, Emily? Yeah, I think that makes total sense. Um, 
we do allow for sort of um, variants, um, but every product has to have a unique product ID. Um, and then there's something, there, there's a number of different ways that you can sort of indicate to us that um, these two products are the same, just different variants of each other. Um, but yeah, I would echo what Brian said. Great. Uh, here's one um, from Troy. Can you pull listings from uh, multiple listing service for realtors? Uh, so I'll, I'll answer this one. I think it's specifically for Feednomics. Um, yes, we we definitely can. There are a few different things we've done uh, for for realtors. Uh, we we can definitely integrate with MLSs to get data out of them to then optimize it or just pass it through to Facebook. Um, but sometimes an MLS isn't available or it's really hard to obtain. So what we do uh, is we actually crawl the website directly um, to create a feed out of it. So Either way, that's that's an option. Yeah, and I would just echo. I think I I mentioned this um, briefly in in the presentation, but um, we do have a number of uh, vertical specific dynamic ad solutions. I was more focused on um, sort of e-commerce, um, which is our original version and sort of the one that all these others have spun off on. Uh, but we offer a solution for real estate. Um, we offer a solution for hotels, for flights, and for destinations. Um, as well as for auto. And a partner like Feedonomics can help you um, prepare your feed for any of those. Thanks, Emily. Um, okay, here's another one. So what is the process within Facebook uh, to, whoops, the question just got pushed down, uh, for Facebook to allow images to be A-B tested using the image link and additional image link? So I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. So the process actually isn't in Facebook. Facebook is what ultimately renders it based off the fee that you provide. So in Feedonomics, what we're able to do is we're able to uh, say, let's say we have um, 100 or 1,000 products in our feed, and we want to A-B test for a specific category. We want to see, is it better to use the additional image link versus the image link? So we, we designate, let's say, 50% of the products, and we can change it to the addi additional image link number one. You might have multiple additional image links. And you can test and see in the, if the performance is better. And after a certain amount of time, uh, you know you can it's you can choose that time as flexibly as you want. You can either go back or use uh, the additional image link if it performs better. So that's something we can do in in Feedonomics itself, and we can also do it for titles in addition to to uh, image link. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one. Um, there's one about uh, variants that Erica asked. Um, hopefully, I answered it with uh, the previous one. It sounds like they're very similar. Erica, if we didn't, please let us know and we'll, we'll answer. Uh, here's a question from a guy with a great name, Brian. <laughs> uh, can you use product feeds to fill Facebook shop for a page? Um, for instance, we do a product feed which fills a catalog for ads, but thus far have to build individual products into Facebook shop separately. It would be great if Facebook shop could pull from our product feed catalog. So this, I'll, I'll take a stab and then Emily, I'm sure you've got a perspective there too. Yeah. Uh, so we, we've actually seen this as a request a couple of times. Um, currently, as far as I'm aware, the only way to fill a Facebook shop with products, um, and that's usually if you have, you know, a, 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 that's usually if you have a Shopify store, there is a way to do it for all of your products, but unfortunately it doesn't allow you to do any optimization on those. So if you're missing brand, you're not going to have brand in your titles. Um, but there is actually a Shops API, which is currently in, in alpha testing, last I checked. And that's something we're actually looking into to, to help solve this, this problem. Um, Emily, I don't know if there's more you, yeah. you have to say or that you can say about it. Yeah, of course. Um, so I would say broadly, we recognize that um, there are sort of confusing and conflicting messages from different, if you look at different APIs about how to use these various things. And part of that confusion is born of, of the fact that um, our catalog team was spun up to support dynamic ads. Um, 
and was sort of focused exclusively on dynamic ads. And only within the last year or so did it become apparent that we actually needed to platformize that team because so many other teams at Facebook were thinking about using inventory. Um, so this is a case of um, we sort of had two APIs that were built to do similar things. Um, behind the scenes, we're working really hard, um, and I'm working very closely with our catalog team to sort of um, – we, call, we think about it as more of like a universal catalog and we want to um, basically re not require people to do a bunch of different things in order to access different products. So rather than having um, a, a method for using Facebook shops and a method for dynamic ads and a method for marketplace, um, in that slide I showed earlier, we're sort of creating a single catalog and based on the information that you, the advertiser or whoever is able to provide to us, they'll sort of unlock different use cases. Um, so if you're only able to provide us like a very limited set of information, you might be able to, um, I don't want to say limited. If you're providing us with a certain set of information, you might be able to list in Marketplace. But um, unless you have a URL, for example, you're not going to be able to use dynamic ads because we actually need to drive off site. So um, echo what Brian said, but at a high level would just reiterate that um, here at Facebook, we're trying to do uh, a lot of work in, in H1 and into H2 of this year to sort of like standardize um, what we're asking advertisers and, and merchants and customers to provide to us in terms of product data and then making it as easy as possible for them to unlock all of these various inventory based use cases um, based again on, on what the data is that they're providing. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so here's another one. Can you elaborate further on prospecting using broad audiences with DPA ads? How would those be configured if the user has not visited my website? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so broadly speaking, our product recommendations are informed um, in a couple different ways. Um, browsing behavior of an individual user, um, browsing behavior of similar people, and information available in the catalog. And for prospecting, um, because again, we're not just relying on the fact that the user visited your individual website or app, uh, but we know a ton about that user because um, we can sort of uh, see what they're doing both on and off Facebook through uh, the Facebook pixel. So while they might not have visited your website, they might have visited another website of a similar category or they might have engaged with a page on Facebook that um, I think one of the examples we use is like people uh, around fitness watches. So they might have gone to a Facebook page where a lot of people are sharing information. They might have asked for recommendations from their friends on Facebook about what particular fitness watch um, is, is really useful. They might be engaged um, in groups that, that are um, sort of focused on people's running and trends like that. Um, so there's a number of different signals that we can sort of collect to inform us that an individual user is interested in um, a product that you sell even if you if they haven't been to your website or app so um it's hard to be super specific because obviously it's very dependent on on the user and and what it is that they're looking at but essentially um, we know a lot about them from uh, their behavior on and off facebook and we know a lot about the products you sell because you've provided us with a really um, rich catalog and that's how we kind of make the match um, between a product and a user Great. Uh, here's, we have time for one more question. Um, if your question was not answered, I will definitely be following up after and connect you with Emily if necessary too. Um, so here's the last question. Uh, for A-B testing, are results evaluated through the publisher? Um, assuming the test is done by splitting the SKUs into two groups, are the two groups served evenly and randomly? Um, so the answer to both of those is yes. So we have the ability to, uh, we have math and random functions inside of Feedonomics so that we can actually split test. Uh, obviously you can never truly have randomness, but as evenly as possible, um, such that you, you can actually evaluate the results um, afterwards on Facebook. So David, hopefully that answers your question. Um, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to email us at uh, hello at Feedonomics and we'll be happy to answer these questions. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we're happy to do any feed audits. Uh, please reach out on our website. And also, uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this one and look 
look forward to the next one. Uh, thanks so much, Emily, for joining us. Um, hopefully, everyone learned quite a bit about Facebook here. Awesome. So, thanks so much for having me, Brian. All right. That's it. Thanks, guys. Bye.